Our next speaker is uh, Rudolf Janisch. Uh, Rudy is a founding member of the Whitehead Institute. He's a professor of biology at MIT and has been since 1984. He's done absolutely remarkable work for which he was, was awarded the National Medal of Science in 2011. His lab for many years has focused on understanding epigenetic regulation of gene expression, and most recently that's read, led to a number of advances in understanding both the programming of embryonic stem cells and the reprogram of in induced pluripotent uh, so-called IPS cells. Uh, Rudy's lab was one of three labs worldwide that reported successfully uh, reprogramming somatic cells into IPS cells and then being able to use those IPS cells to derive uh, basically any cell line or any cell type that you want. It's hard to overstate the importance uh, of this discovery in IPS cells uh, since they offer all kinds of new possibilities for the treatment of a wide range of human diseases. Really? Well, thank you, Mike. About cancer or different states of cancer cells, resistant or non-resistant, but rather about different cell states in, in um, normal development or in reprogramming. So there have been different ways to reprogram um, cells. Uh, one is uh, nuclear transfer. Obviously, you take a somatic nucleus and introduce it into the egg of uh, which its own nucleus has been removed, and you come to, to um, pluripotent cells. Uh, fusion between embryonic stem cells and somatic cells can reactivate the pluripotency properties of the cells and um, by defined factors, which of course um, was, uh, uh, and these two approaches, the nuclear transfer and, and, uh, and direct reprogramming came again into focus, although they didn't need it with the decision from Stockholm um, last month. So I'm going to talk about really um, about the IPS approach. So. The basis for the IPS uh, approach was, of course, knowing the ES cell regulatory circuitry, where the three transcription vectors, NANOC, OC4, and SOX2, are really upstream of many downstream genes. And they also form this auto regulatory loop um, to, to, to sustain pluripotency. So when IPS cells were discovered now six years ago, people asked the question, how does it work? That's what I really want to talk about. So what was known, it's a long process. You start to express um, the factors, the Yamanaka factors at day zero, and then within a few days, some markers come up, like alkaline phosphatase or SE1 or 3B, um, which are not expressed in the starting cells. And um, uh, proteins like Thi1, which are expressed in the starting MEFs, will be turned off over a few days. And then eventually, you get IPS cells, for example, marked by the activation of OCT4 or NANOC some of these um, key pluripotency factors. And it was also known that you needed transgene expression for a certain number of days. If you turn off the transgenes too early, the cells revert. So there's a sequential inactivation of somatic and activation of pluripotency markers, and it takes a, few, a number of days to keep the genes, the transgenes on. So to study the mechanism, it was really important not to use viruses, as in the original Yamanaka experiments, now experiments was, but do it without viruses. So this is really has been a very important tool. So let me just briefly um, introduce the tool, which was basically taking doxycycline-inducible vectors, which transduce the four um, uh, reprogramming factors, and generate um, primary iPS cells. And you can withdraw now the doxycycline. They will be still pluripotent. You can inject them into a blastocyst of a mouse to make a chimera, where the chimeric cells are derived from one of these cells. And then you can, from those, can take secondary fibroblasts from this. And now, to study the reprogramming process, you just have to add docs. And you can, um, and these cells are marked by GFP in the nanoglocus, for example. And you can study the reprogramming now um, um, just after doxycycline induction um, without any new viral infection because you pre-select for the right viral um, combination uh, and stoichiometry at, in one of these colonies. So this is a much more efficient process. So that's what we're going to use. So there were a couple of models um, how this works. One is called the deterministic model where either all or some of the cells, starting cells, have the ability to make an IPS cell with a constant 
um, uh, latency, so we will fix critical time before IPS cells appear, or all or some cells have it with a variable latency. So it's thought that here the factors um, act like a switch. You turn on and you after a certain amount of time you get your IPS cells. Or here they initiate a long process. And they thought this is going to be the model for, for nuclear transfer and this one for IPS cells. So we're interested to, um, to, to really um, study that. And so I will briefly go for these experiments. What was done was the efficiency, how we define it. Most people define it as a fraction of input donor cells, which give you IPS cells. We want to define it as the potential of a donor cell to give you, at some point, an IPS daughter. And the approach was to assess reprogramming in clonal populations of pro-B cells. Now, why pro-B cells and not MEFs, which most people use? Because these cells are homogeneous, and they have a genetic marker. So you know what you started with in, in, in heavy chain rearrangement, for example. They have a very high cloning efficiency. MEFs have a very clo low cloning efficiency. And they require no immortalization. So these are some technical advantages of the pro-B cell system. And so the experiment was done by Jakob Hanna and Chris Saha. And it was really very simple. Using the secondary approach, where we have nano GFP uh, in these cells, GFP in the nano locus, and they have these inducible factors. You make them, put them into, uh, make chimeras with those. You isolate the pro-B cells. And now because of the single cell cloning division, you can put one cell per one well of a 96 well plate and now um, passage them every week and ask the question, when does a given well turn on GFP? So when do they make um, IPS cells? And you can do this for a number of months, four to five months, and you ask the question, what fraction can do it? And the answer was very simple in this one slide here. Um, basically, all cells, more than 90%, can do it, but it takes four to five months. So, this, so the conclusion was basically all pro-B cells have the potential to generate IPS cells with at some point. Although, of course, the efficiency is very low because they have this enormous expansion of replication. But, um, but it really immediately uh, eliminates three of these models and leaves us with this one, namely that every somatic cell has a potential to generate IPS cells by a stochastic process. Okay, so that's what we're interested in. So the, 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 if I summarize what we learned then, direct reprogramming is re-established in the core loop. All somatic cells can do it. The process is initiated by the four factors. It involves extensive epigenetic resetting and multiple cell divisions. So the key is to get this loop um, active and then all the downstream genes will, be, will fall, in, fall in place. So let me just remind you of the beginning of uh, reprogram. It's a long process. And um, in the original Yamanaka experiment, until you get pluripotent cells. But in the initial um, Yamanaka experiment, he selected for activation of this FPX15 gene, which is downstream of OCT4. And what he got in this 2006 paper were not really fully reprogrammed cells. They were partially reprogrammed. They, the retroviruses were not silenced. The endogenous OCT4 locus was not activated. Many lineage markers were still on, and they couldn't make chimeras. One of the reasons that some people doubted this were initially the experiments. And only a year later, when, um, it, with, the, with the modified approach, and when it was when OCT4 nanoc um, uh, activation was looked for, you got fully reprogrammed cells, and um, the rate of rise were silenced here, the endogenous OCT4 nanoc were activated, and these mm, cells could make chimeras. So this was really then the fully reprogrammed cells. I will come back to the FPX15 gene. Another early experiment was when you take, after six days of, treat, of, of factor expression, you have transformed colonies, and you take a single cell, so a single colony, you ask the question, when now a weather the daughters can make IPS cells. You find some daughters can make it fast, some others later, some much later, and some never. Now, these are genetically identical cells. So it's consistent with the stochastic epigenetic events involved in reprogramming, and it's unpredictable whether a given cell ever makes an IPS cell or early or late. So this is the stochastic events. We were really interested in that to, to, to understand what's going on. So as I said, there were two models. The deterministic model, maybe the one in nuclear transfer and ES cell fusion with a constant latency, and the, determinist, the stochastic model, um, which people thought was um, an IPS cell generation. 
But there are a number of unresolved issues. How do single cells behave here, as I said? Is there a predictive early and late markers for successful reprogramming? So can you predict by any marker whether this cell makes it early and this one makes it late? Can we take, detect any consecutive hierarchical um, gene activation um, events, or is it everything is random? Stochastic, you just have to activate OCT4, hit, octi um, hit demethylation, let's say, the OCT4 locus, and then you become an IPS cell, but it's random. And is it possible to do this whole thing without the Yamanaga factors? So I want to address those points. So I hope have people studied that. So these are two papers three years ago. They studied gene expression, gene activation during the process of IPS formation. They can distinguish several different st uh, stages. And for example, mesenchymal epithelial transition would be an earlier one by looking at total gene expression. Now, there's a limitation to this approach, and it, it's on this slide here. So you start with a reasonably homogeneous population, and you end up with a reasonably homogeneous population. But what we're interested in is this intermediate population, which is highly heterogeneous. So when you do now the um, uh, Northern analysis or um, RT-PCR, you have this heterogeneous population. If you do the RT-PCR, what you get is the average. So what you basically do is you measure gene activation never in those which form IPS cells, but you measure it only in those cells which don't form it, in the irrelevant cells, basically. So that's the issue which we were concerned with, which really um, needs um, um, uh, uh, calls for single cell um, 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 expression analysis. And I'm going to talk about this. So we used two approaches, and they were done by Nina Fada, a graduate student, and Josi Burgan, a postdoc in the lab. So we used two um, 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 approaches. One was a single molecule RNA fish, where you have multiple 48 oligonucleotide probes. You can measure the expression of a single RNA. It was done together with Alexander Van Uden Ernest Laboratory. So you have these red and um, um, green dots here on this ES cell. Each one is one RNA molecule. So for example, red would be SOX2, nano, um, uh, green would be NANOX. So you count the dots, you come to the conclusion there are 70 SOX2 mRNAs and 35 um, NANOX. And you plot the cell in this diagram here. If you do it for the whole population, you find very variable expression. You find some cells which don't express either. It's all in ES cells. Some express only one gene, and others express both. So that's one um, an essay. And the other one is, uh, and let's give you another example. If you look here for, um, in this published paper, for Stella, for example, which is a certain level of expression. But if you do the single RNA molecule expression, you find many cells do not express uh, Stella, but they do express OCT4, and other express too. So it's a very different, different uh, result. The other approach was the fluidime analysis, where you can, um, with a microchip, you can measure RNA of uh, 48 genes, and you do the duplicate, in 96 single cells. And we used this, and we selected now two years ago, these markers, MEF markers, pluripotency markers, signaling pathway markers, chromatin modifiers, and cells. cell regulators. So they're here, the, the, the all known, well-known molecules. It was a selection of 48, um, 48 genes. And all that I'm telling you is based just on these 48 genes. We're blind to anything else. So again, the experiment was then to um, really measure the doxycycline-induced reprogramming step, step and we're looking for um, NANOC GFP activation, which is a very good marker for, for IPS cells. So this is the experiment. So we start, you give doxycycline for six days, and you see colonies. You take a single colony, and now look only in, in, in sister cells. So we take each colony, this will be now propagated separately from the other colonies over the next four or five months. And in between, we will always do um, analysis by, by fluidine. So there are five cell types we analyze. First, the early cells, which are not clonal. Then sister cells in the early, early clones, they're still doxy-dependent, but they don't express any markers. Then intermediate colonies, which are GFP positive or negative, but they're still dox-dependent. They arrive between 30 and 60 days in the system. IPS cells, which are GFP positive and dox independent. And finally, very important, the partially reprogrammed cells, the ones which are stuck, which never make it to an IPS cell, like the Yamanaka original cells. And they will be important. So 
these are the five populations which are clonal. And then in addition, we have these cells, the starting and the ending cells, and then these non-clonal early um, doxycycline inducible cells. And one question we're asking is, can we, using these 48 genes, can we define certain genes which predict whether a cell makes an iPS cell or not? So when you do PC um, um, air analysis, you see and you distribute now these about 7,000 cells. Then we find a starting population of the MEF, see that in more darker colors, and a reasonably homogeneous end up um, in population, iPS cells, and then something in between which is very heterogeneous. So they're two defined and one heterogeneous intermediate population. And this gives you some of the data. FBX15, the Yamanaka original gene, this is plotted now single cells expressing um, in, um, in a certain level here. You can see in the early um, phases, there's really most cells don't express um, um, FBX15. Some do. Then you come to this phase where there's bimodal expression. And these are clonal populations. Part of the clonal population don't express. The other one does. And then becomes mono. Uh, unimodal, all express, of course, FBX15. Importantly, the stuck cells express it or don't, don't express it. So if you summarize this, early and used cells express, rare cells, intermediate cells, some do, some do not, late stage, all express. But importantly, those cells which never make it also express, can express FBX15. So clearly, this gives you false positives. It's not a good marker to predict whether you make an IPS cell. A similar result is for OCT4, which was really surprising. OCT4 is absolutely essential, but it's not predictive because you have in the, in the stuck cells, there might be OCT4 positive, but they're not IPS cells. So OCT4 is not a good predictor because you have false positives. And two more examples. UDF1, another one of these transcription factors. And again, we go through the same unimodal, bimodal, unimodal um, 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 expression. But the part reprogrammed cells do not express it. So this could be something which predicts you, you will become an IPS cell. And another example, ESSRB, and you have a very similar um, conclusion. The partially reprogrammed cells do not express it. OK, so let me just remind you, only a very small fraction of the starting population ever makes an IPS cell. And can we define a predictor early? And is there any hierarchical sequential gene activation during reprogramming? So for this, will be early potentially predictive marker. UTF1, DCRB, you can see at six days, very few cells of the population express it. You can see some examples here. Whereas cell four, many cells express early, many more than ever make iPS cells. Cell four is absolutely essential. And of course, ESRB expression would never detect by, by PCR at, at six days. So coming back to this scheme here, MET was an early event, which is uh, really snail is expressed in the starting cells. It's um, e and gets activated after the transition. And we asked the question, is that an early event by this? And we looked at um, snail and cartierin. And you can see early, they're both, some which express only snail, others, and some express both. And then you're getting more and more separated into cells which express cartierin and those which do not. So cartierin becomes activated, snail repressed, which is consistent with MET being an early marker. But what fraction of these cells will make iPS cells? So we can look now at these markers, UTF1, ESRB, and you can see that uh, either at six days or 12 days, very few cells um, express UTF1, ESRB. Many more do express cell 4 and later again. So again, many MET um, uh, positive cells express cell 4, only few ESRB which is again um, consists with MET, certainly being a non-predictive marker. So the non-predictive markers would be expressed in iPS cells, not expressed in the starting cells, but also expressed in the partially reprogrammed cells, whereas the predictive ones would be also expressed in iPS cells, not expressed in MEFs, but not expressed in partial cells. So the non-predictive ones, the key would be they would be expressed in the partially reprogrammed cells, but from the predictive markers, they would be not expressed in those, but expressed in rare early cells. So if you do P PCA analysis for the genes, you again get, can make two, two populations here out, the, the starting and the, 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 the um, ending in, in genes, the pluripotency genes. And the question was, when you now look at this, can you really make sequential gene activation network? 
And we did that. It's called the Bayes network. And it's give you this way the probability of genes interacting with each other and activating each other is taken into account. And this Bayes network has SOX2 at its top. And um, it's activated by ESRB. And OCT4 is downstream of SOL4. And NANOC is in a different pathway. Now, whatever that means, you want to test that. And so we tested that. And now using single RNA fish to make to see whether this prediction of a sequential hierarchical activation um, are valid. So we took at least these three genes. You would predict. You would find cells which express all three genes, cells which express SOX2 and SOL4, or SOL4 and FGR4, but not cells which express only SOX2 and FGR4, because SOL4 should be the one which activates us, if that was correct. For this one, very similar, you would predict that you find triple positive cells, single positive cells, of course, and FBX15 and SOX2, um, and SOL4 and FBX15, or SOX2 and SOL4, but not SOX2 and FBX15 only cells. And the final example, this one, you should find again the triple positive ones, this and this double positive, but not cells which only express SOX2 and DNM DNMT3B. So test, and this was just showing you the data. You look at the at these cells, you just count the dots, and you find that this is a double positive, and these are triple positive cells. So it's rather straightforward. So the first combination, SOX2, SOL4, and FGF4. And we can see is we find, maybe looking at almost 300 cells, we find single positive cells, double positive cells, and triple positive cells, but not cells which only express SOX2 and FGF4. So this was consistent with the hierarchical, um, hierarchical uh, relation. Uh, this, this combination, SOX2, LIN28, 3B, very similar, single positive cells, double positive cells, this one, and LIN24, 3B, but not any which is SOX2 or 3B, 3B only. And then the final one, SOX2, cell 4 FBX15, it's a very similar result, single positive, double positive, and only one cell which expressed SOX2 and FBX15 only, and it had one transcript, was very low. So this was all consistent with this hierarchical model. But a much better tr prediction would be, can you replace the downstream genes, the, the upstream genes with the downstream genes? And let me come to my last experiment then. So could we, for example, can ESRB replace SOX2, as would be predicted? And again, when we go through this here, you can see there's really a substantial activation of GFP, and you get colonies which can make chimeras. So in this case, we have no SOX2, because SOX2 was predicted to be activated by ESRB. SOL4, can it replace OCT4? And again, find the same thing. Efficiently, we can e e replace OCT4 and make um, cells which can make chimeras. In this case, it was no OCT4, because this network would predict SOL4 could activate OCT4. And finally, may, maybe more interesting would be no Yamanaka factor whatsoever. So we're just using these, these downstream genes. And again, we find um, um, cells which are um, um, chimera competent. And in this case, there was no SOX2, no OCT4, and no KLF1 CMUG. That's why it's rather inefficient, because this boosts the efficiency. And actually, we were also interested in NANOC, so we replaced now also NANOC by DPPA2. And again, very similar. We can get um, um, germline competent cells, no SOX2, no OCT4, no KLF1 CMUG, and no NANOC. All are really predicted by this. And finally, a negative result, EZH2, which is down here, can it replace ESRB? And it cannot. So you get colonies, you take doxycycline away, they degenerate, and none, none of them forms a GFP positive cells. And in this case, there's no ESRB, so we would predict there shouldn't be any SOX2 activation. So this was all rather consistent with this type of thing. So let me just conclude then from, from what we have learned. So the cellular reprogramming is a stochastic process with a high gene expression variation early, but this variation decreases substantially later. These factors, ESRB, UTF1, LIN28, DPPA, are much more predictive early markers than for reprogramming than, for example, FBX15, OCT4, and so on. That's important. The activation of SOX2 is a late, is, occurs in the late state of the progress, and this initiates now a hierarchical gene expression profiling, which I, 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 I discussed. And finally, we can 
use um, um, as predicted from this network. We can use other than the Yamanaka factors or Nanok factors to induce reprogramming. So what we think is, you put these factors into MEFs, you go through this stochastic probabilistic phase. We don't know really how to explain that. But you end up, once you get to SOX2, then it gets rather predictable, as I showed you. Of course, we don't know whether there's hierarchical deterministic hidden here, because we don't know yet if a cell which has activated UTF1, maybe it follows a hierarchical deterministic process. We just have to identify those. So at this point, we have to really prospectively isolate these cells and see whether what their efficiency is to generate um, 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 IPS cells as compared to those which don't express, for example, UTF1. So the, the probabilistic events would decrease when you go through the process and you come to the more um, deterministic events. So when you come back to this, what we believe is this transition where SOX2 gets activated might be just exactly here. So this is where we start here. And once you cross this over, then SOX2 really this, this, this might occur in here. So that might be the, the transition. So my last slide, just let me come back to the various ways you can make pluripotent cells either by nuclear transfer, by fusion, or by um, transcription factors. And so the mechanism of gene activation was thought this might be deterministic because really reasoning is it's very fast. That's really the only reasoning, and one could argue that sufficient or not, but many people believe that. Um, whereas in direct reprogramming, you might have really two phases, an early probabilistic stochastic phase in the late hierarchical sequential phase. So I think there are many issues we, we will have to resolve, but I think it's really important, which I wanted to emphasize. If one has these population transitions, one has to look at single cells. And I think that's probably also important for when you look for transitions between certain states of cancer cells um, from um, whatever transitions um, we have to measure. So let me just come to the end. And just to acknowledge the people I mentioned, all the names, Josie Buganem and Dina Fada were really the drivers of the experiment. Albert Cheng and Shela Makulagi contributed. The early experiments for the pre pro B cells were done by Jakob Hanna and Chris Saar and really collaborated with the Van Houten Arden Laboratory. Thank you. Terrific. Do we have some questions? Uh, let me start with one. The, um, in analyzing that network of the hierarchy of the genes, um, with, those, uh, with those constructed from what I'll call um, concomitant time points, because otherwise I could imagine dynamically the first yes. one could be on, the second one could transiently be on, yeah. and then turn the other one on and right. go off. So. so it was putting the whole system about something like 7,000 7, single cell analysis into this, I can't tell you how it was done, yeah. it was done by Albert Cheng, um, and then coming up with this totally, in, and then we tested that. So it was really putting the different time points as well as what, whatever you find at a given cell. OK, right. so it wasn't chronology. It was all no. time points right. taken together. Right. Right. Yeah. OK, fascinating. Uh, others? Yeah, please. So you're using doxycycline to induce your uh, gene expression. How much single cell variation is there in the genes that are induced by the doxycycline? Yeah, so this, this, is, this is, I think, a good question. So these, these were all single vectors in integrated different spots. And when you look, we look carefully at this, it's stochastic. So not all cells express all four. Some express three, two. So you have certainly there a stochasticity. Um, that's inherent in this process of activating those. We have then done the same experiment with de novo um, in, in, in infection of these viruses and you can do the same, same, same um, um, control. So I think it just increases your, your, your early sort of probabilistic variability between the cells. Yeah, certainly. Okay, if no others, let's thank Rudolf for a fascinating talk.